summer has faded now, and these first days of November mark the beginning of the coming of winter. The frost has arrived to steal away the last hardy blossoms in our gardens. Leaves are falling from the trees to create a rich layer of insulation for the earth beneath. Geese are flying south, and some of us have been blessed to see them flying overhead in formation. Last night we turned our clocks back an hour, and now the days are crisp and cold, the evenings suddenly dark. The children, and even the adults in this town, have played with death and fear in the form of Halloween costumes and haunted houses. Christians have marked All Saints and All Souls Days, both holidays commemorating the dead. And in Mexico, families have just celebrated Dia de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead. If we were members of traditional Mexican families, we would have gone last night to have a picnic on the graves of our relatives, celebrating, remembering, and honoring. We would have taken the food from our altars, favorite foods of loved ones passed away, prepared lovingly in their honor, and placed there on the altar beside their pictures, we would have taken these foods to the cemetery to serve as the basis of our feast, a celebration. These Day of the Dead traditions, building altars and picnicking in graveyards, are ones that honor death instead of running from it. Ones that celebrate life along with death, death incorporated into life, life and death intermingled. A little history. More than 500 years ago, when the Spanish conquistadores landed in what is now central Mexico, they encountered natives practicing a ritual that seemed to mock death. It was a ritual the indigenous people had been practicing at least 3,000 years. Today, it is known as Dia de los Muertos. When the Spanish infiltrated, they brought with them their Catholic faith and began an effort to convert the indigenous people and put an end to the sacrilegious and pagan observances. Their attempts to squash the rituals were unsuccessful. But over time, the celebration was moved to November to coincide with the Catholic holidays, All Saints Day and All Souls Day. Although the Day of the Dead has merged some with Catholic theology, it still maintains the basic principles of the Aztec rituals. Unlike the Spaniards, who viewed death as the end of life, the natives viewed it as the continuation of life. Instead of fearing death, they embraced it. To them, life was a dream, and only in death did they become truly awake. During this ritual, they would often display skulls that they had collected as symbols of life, death, and rebirth. The Day of the Dead has a rich history, but it is also a living tradition, which means that elements of it are ancient and connect us with previous generations, and elements of it change as it is used in new ways by people and communities making sense of life and death in new circumstances and in new surroundings. Today's Day of the Dead altars make political statements, such as altars built to the death of democracy. They are light-hearted, as in altars made for favorite canceled TV shows. They are educational, as in altars dedicated to famous figures in history. Most of us are far from the grave sites of our ancestors. But we also can honor those who have gone before us. We also can recognize the interconnectedness of life and death. We can invite death into our sanctuary today 
as we honor those we have lost, but also as a way of including death in our spiritual lives in a playful way, in a sort of, I'm not afraid of you gesture. We can also take part in the living tradition of the Day of the Dead by creating an altar with a message. Our altar today, which so many of you helped to build, thank you, is in honor and recognition of the many immigrants who have died coming to this country and to those who have died in U.S. detention centers jailed for being undocumented. It is in honor of the lives not being lived by undocumented immigrants waiting in detention centers all over this country and as close by as Plymouth. This morning, we will explore our altar together as a way to hear these stories, both ancient and new. <coughs> we begin with marigolds. Marigolds are an important Day of the Dead symbol. They're also really hard to find this time of year on the Cape. I saw a lot of marigolds in yards in East Ham and I did not pull over and dig them up. <laughs> Just want some credit for that because I had the thought. <laughs> These yellow and orange flowers are known as the flower of the dead. You'll see marigolds sprinkled on altars and on graves. They are chosen for their bright color and strong scent, which is supposed to lead the dead to their altar. In some villages, people leave a trail of marigolds from their front door to a loved one's grave so that the deceased may easily find their way back home again. The dead are not gone. They return. You can take this as literally or as figuratively as you are comfortable with. As I researched the Day of the Dead and the meaning of the different elements, like marigolds, I drew a connection to the academic work of our own Denny class, who has written and edited many works about grieving. In a recent book chapter, he described a shift in thinking in psychology about continuing bonds with the dead. He says, for decades, the overwhelming consensus among psychologists and psychiatrists was that for successful mourning to take place, the mourner must disengage from the deceased, let go of the past, and move on. But now, a consensus is emerging in bereavement studies that continuing bonds are a common, healthy, and enduring element in the resolution of grief. He lifts up the story of John Bowlby, who established the study of bereavement as a subset of attachment theory. After Bowlby died, his wife Ursula wrote, instead of being shattered, I felt suddenly comforted. He seemed secure in my heart and I knew that I could carry him about with me for the rest of my life. I have this sense of continuous companionship. I am never lonely. Denny has done decades of work with grieving parents, and this newer theory of the healthy nature of continuing bonds rings true to him from that work. Grieving parents continue to have relationships with their children no matter how many years have passed since their deaths. And often those relationships are a great comfort. This lived experience fits in with the ancient Aztec ritual of leaving a trail of marigolds from a loved one's grave to your door because their spirits are not something to fear, but rather something to welcome home again each year. And so we have marigolds on our altar today. What else is there? 
there are several objects with a skeleton or a skull motif. Papel Picado is a popular Day of the Dead decoration. It refers to colorful tissue paper that is cut with elaborate designs depicting the holiday spirit. Images of grinning skulls and cavorting skeletons are the most prevalent Papel Picado designs you'll see. These playful depictions of death help us to be not so frightened of it. We have some wonderful breads baked in the shape of skulls. Thank you, Diana and Kathleen. Pan de Muerto, literally bread of the dead, is a sugary sweet bread enjoyed by the families of the deceased during Dia de los Muertos and placed on the altar. I invite you to try a piece at coffee hour. The prominence of skulls as a Day of the Dead icon harkens back to the days of the Aztecs. Back then, skulls were important icons that illustrated their belief in the existence of an afterlife. In Mexican culture, skulls continue to symbolize death and rebirth. Day of the Dead skulls take on many forms. In addition to bread, you'll see them as sugar skulls and chocolate candies. Skeletons are another prominent Day of the Dead icon. Day of the Dead skeletons can take many forms too, but all of them are whimsical and joyful, never scary or sad. Dia de los Muertos skeletons are typically long, skinny, and well-dressed, like the famous skeletons drawn by Mexican artist Jose Guadalupe Posada. Posada's skeletons are among the most famous Day of the Dead icons because they poke sarcastic fun at how death is the great equalizer. Even the rich cannot escape from death. What else do we have on our altar today? We have a jug of water, similar to those jugs left in the desert by the group No More Deaths. Here's where we get political. Undocumented migrants cross into Arizona and other border states in overwhelming numbers, pushed into dangerous deserts by a U.S. border policy that seals off safer urban crossings. In peak years, border patrol agents in Arizona's Tucson sector catch more than a thousand migrants a day. And Arizona has the highest number of migrant deaths. Let me tell you about one of those deaths. This story comes from the UUA's 2010 Common Read book, The Death of Hoseline by Margaret Reagan. Hoseline shivered as she stepped over the stones and ducked under the mesquites. She was in Arizona, land of heat and sun, but on this late January day in 2008, it was cold and damp. The temperature was in the 50s, and the night before it had dropped to near freezing. A winter rain had fallen, and now the desert path was slippery and wet, even more treacherous than it had been before. Hoseline was seven miles north of the Mexican border, near the old ranching town of Arivaca in prime Sonoran desert. It was a wonderland of cactus and mesquite, beautiful but dangerous, with trails threading through isolated canyons and up and down hills studded with rocks. She had to get through this perilous place to get to her mother, a little girl with a big name, Joseline Amilef Hernandez Quinteros. She was five feet tall and 100 pounds, at 14, young as she was, she had an important responsibility. It was her job to bring her little brother, age 10, safely to their mother in Los Angeles. The Hernandez kids had never been away from home, and already they'd been traveling for weeks. Now they were almost there, just days away from their mother's embrace. The family hadn't been together in a long time. Their father, Santos, was living somewhere in Maryland, their mother, Sonia, in California. Both parents were undocumented, working in the shadows. 
back home in El Salvador, the kids lived with relatives. And in the years their mom was gone, Joseline had become a little mother to her brother. Finally, Sonia had worked long enough and hard enough to save up the money to send for her children. She'd arranged for Joseline and her brother to come north with adults they knew from home, people she trusted. The group had crossed from El Salvador into Guatemala, then traveled 2,000 miles from the southern tip of Mexico to the north. The trip had been arduous. In Mexico, the migrants feared the federales, the national police. And now, in the United States, they were trying to evade the border control, the dreaded migra. But here in the borderlands, they were in the hands of a professional. Like the thousands of other undocumented migrants pouring into Arizona, jumping over walls, trekking across mountains, hiking through deserts, their group had contracted with a coyote, a smuggler paid to spirit them over the international line. The coyote fee, many thousands of dollars, was to pay for Joseline and her brother to be taken from El Salvador all the way to their mother in Los Angeles. So far, everything had gone according to plan. They had slipped over the border from Mexico and had spent a couple of days picking their way through this strange desert with spiky cacti clawing at their skin and the rocky trail blistering their feet. The coyote insisted on a fast pace. They still had a hike of 20 miles ahead of them out to the northbound highway where their ride would meet them and take them deep into the United States. Hoseline pulled her two jackets closer in the cold. She was wearing everything she had brought with her from home. Her clothes betrayed her girly tastes. One jacket was lined in pink. Her sneakers were a wild bright green, not even close to adequate for the difficult path she was walking. Best of all were her sweatpants with the word Hollywood emblazoned on the back. Hoseline planned to have them on when she arrived in the land of movie stars. She tried to keep up with the group, but by the time they got to Cedar Canyon, she was lagging. She was beginning to feel sick. She'd been on the road for weeks and out in the open for days, sleeping on damp ground. Now she was too weak to stand up, let alone hike this roller coaster trail out to the road. It was a problem. The group was on a strict schedule. They had that ride to catch. And the longer they lingered here, the more likely they'd be caught. The coyote had a decision to make. And this is the one he made. He would leave the young girl behind, alone in the desert. Hoseline died alone in the wilderness in February 2008. It is to her and to thousands of others that we dedicate this altar. It's hard, but let's continue to explore what we have built. We have food on our altar. Historically, families would lovingly prepare the favorite foods of the deceased. We have prepared bags of rice and beans. This is why. Another story. From Arizona, travel south with me to Mexico. Come down into the peninsula as far as Mexico City and head still further southeast to a rural sugarcane growing region of the Mexican state of Veracruz called La Patrona. Imagine with me a cargo train barreling through the countryside. Then picture with me the tops of the train cars. Find there dozens of hopeful and frightened migrants clinging to the trains and to dreams of a better life. The migrants are coming mainly from Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, a few from Nicaragua, mostly men but also women and some children. Most are hoping to make it to the U.S. to find work, but first they must make it through Mexico. They call the train La Bestia, the beast. It is a fearsome thing to ride. 
On it they risk not only falling asleep and falling to their deaths or getting limbs caught under the train, but also being robbed, kidnapped, killed. On that dangerous passage, there is one bright spot, La Patrona. For 17 years, a group of women in La Patrona, Veracruz, has been handing out food and water to Central American migrants, riding cargo trains north in search of work. Their story began in February 1995, when two sisters, Bernarda and Rosa, were standing with their groceries at a train crossing in the village, waiting for the train to pass. Migrants on the first train began shouting, Madre, I'm hungry. The shout was picked up by people on the second car. When shouts came from a third car, the women tossed them their food, their grocery bags. It's bad, reflects Bernarda, that here we have beans, tortillas, and a cup of coffee, and they have nothing. Soon after, Bernarda and Rosa met with their parents and other siblings, and the family decided to hand out food and water to the migrants. The women who have come to be known as Las Patronas haven't missed a day in 17 years. The trains have no set schedule. Some days only one train passes by. Other days it may be as many as three. The women meet every one. They don't get paid, but one woman, Norma, says, I believe that the best payment that we get is the blessings of all the people who pass through. How amazing these women are, las patronas. They will never meet the people that they help each day. The thank yous they receive rush by at the speed of a train. And yet they haven't missed a day in almost 20 years. And in their giving, they feel blessed. Our tour of our altar is now complete. I hope you will come forward after the service to look more closely. You will see more intricacies of our altar. You can see photos of migrants riding La Bestia, undocumented people in detention centers, women throwing food to a train of hungry travelers. And as a closing, I invite you to join Melissa and me in a ritual of speaking aloud the names of those we dedicate our altar to. Today we read the names of those who arrived hopefully in the United States over the last two years, but who died in detention centers, waiting to be deported back to their countries. It's a hauntingly long list. And though the list would go on and on if we also included all those who have died in the desert or on the cargo trains of Mexico, we also lift up as our last name Hoseline. We'll let her name speak for all of those who never made it here to the U.S., who died trying. After each name and country of origin is read, I invite you to respond presente. Melissa. Miguel Angel Sarabia Ortega, Mexico. Presente. Presente. Fernando Dominguez, Valivia, Mexico. Presente. Presente. Evelyn Ali Manza, Gabón. Presente. Juan Pablo Flores Segura, Mexico. Presente. Manuel Cota Domingo, Guatemala. Presente. Blaston Smith, Tortola. Presente. Tiombe Carlos, Antigua. Presente. Elsa Guadalupe González, Guatemala. Presente. Presente. Jorge García Mejía, Guatemala. Presente. Mm -hmm. Clemente Nengola Momponda, Mozambique. 
Presente. Lelis Rodriguez, Honduras. Presente. Federico Mendez Hernandez, Guatemala. Presente. Aldrich Tomanek, Czechoslovakia. Presente. Pablo Ortiz Matamoros, Honduras. Presente. And representing 6,000 desert deaths since the mid 1990s, Jocelyn Hamilith Hernandez Quinteros, El Salvador. Presente. Presente. Take a moment to lift up those memories. to end with a song that we've sung before and I told you a little bit of the history of it it was written for marriage equality standing on the side of love but when the UUA started working on immigration we found that the words fit perfectly there too and we're still standing on the side of love so I invite you to join me in singing hymn number 1014 in this teal hymnal, standing on the side of love. Please stand as you are able. <laughs> <laughs> 